My name is David Ginsberg. I'm in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at the University of Michigan. Dr. David Ginsberg has contributed numerous articles on thrombosis and hemostasis for blood. My major focus of my research and uh, clinical activity is uh, the genetics of inherited bleeding and blood clotting problems. This particular paper uh, focuses on the cellular origin of factor VIII. Factor VIII is the blood clotting factor that's missing in hemophilics. It's encoded by a gene on the X chromosome, and when you got that gene doesn't work right, you have classic hemophilia A. The source of factor VIII, surprisingly, has been very hard to nail down. So this has been sitting around, and all of us hematologists sort of, you know, we all had our own biases of what the answer might be, but this was still sort of a lurking question. Um, so that's sort of the, the background. Uh, and uh, uh, this is all the work of a really talented MD-PhD student in my lab, uh, Leslie Everett. And Leslie was studying a rare genetic disease that we've been working on in the lab for a number of years called combined deficiency of factor V and factor VIII. So patients with this disease have mutations in one of two genes, and it turns out that they interfere with the way the cell um, makes factor V and factor VIII. And so Leslie was studying one of these genes called LMAN1 in the mouse, and she'd made a mouse who was missing that gene. And in, in this mouse, we could, using uh, all these cool new genetic tricks we have, we could manipulate the mouse to eliminate this gene just in one cell type or another. So she made mice. Some mice were missing this LMAN1 only in their liver cells, the hepatocyte, and other mice were missing this gene only in their endothelial cells. And what she observed, it was really quite exciting and uh, very clear cut. What she observed was that if you remove this LMAN1 only from the liver, then factor V, which we knew is made in hepatocytes, went down, just like in a person who was missing the gene entirely. But factor VIII levels didn't change at all. So that told us factor V was made in the hepatocyte. We knew that already. That made sense. Uh, but it also told us that factor VIII was not made in the hepatocyte. And now when we removed the, this gene just from the bone marrow cells and, and endothelial cells, really primarily the endothelial cells we were interested in, um, then factor, factor V didn't change at all because it was still being made in the hepatocyte, but factor VIII went down just like it does in patients who are missing the gene everywhere. So this told us pretty definitively that factor VIII was made within the endothelial cell, in the liver and other tissues. We then did another uh, uh, experiment uh, using another method. Uh, there's a, a postdoc in the lab, Audrey Clurin, who pioneered this approach. And she worked out a way of selectively pulling out the mRNA from endothelial cells in all different kinds of tissues. And what she found is when she pulled out the mRNA just from endothelial cells in the liver, that's where the factor eight is. It isn't in the hepatocyte. Well, that confirmed our other finding. But in addition, what she found is that factor VIII wasn't made equally in all different types of endothelial cells. It seemed to be made the most in the endothelial cells in the liver, somewhat in kidney, very little in brain, and so this whole idea that endothelial cells may be different in different tissues. We have lots of reason to think that previously, but this fit well with that idea. So that's all been uh, uh, pretty exciting and opened up new avenues that we're going to pursue in the future. Now using these incredible new tools we have, let's look at all the genes that are being expressed in all these different types of endothelial cells and which ones are unique to endothelial cells in the liver or in the brain or this part of the brain or this part of the liver and how does that change under various disease states like if you have an infection or if you're bleeding or had a blood clot and we're going to put a major effort in, on using these tools to try to address some of those questions. And this is an amazingly exciting time from the scientific point of view. And I, I hope this is going to translate to real uh, impacts on treatment of patients, but that's still going to take some time. There's going to be lots of really new, very exciting stuff. And, you know, the readers of blood just need to stay tuned because it'll all be there soon.